On this episode of Survival Dispatch News, we are going to the dogs because we're talking canine preparedness. This Survival Dispatch video is brought to you by Victos Tactical Apparel, creating innovative tactical gear for combat, training, everyday carry, and R&R. And we're back with Survival Dispatch News. And guys, I have an absolute all-star panel here for us today. And we are talking about something that really doesn't get enough attention here in the preparedness community. And that is getting your dog preparedness ready for any type of urban disaster or disaster you may encounter. Now, before we get into it, I want to make sure that you go ahead and get down in the comment section. Leave us a comment. Let us know what type of dog you have. And while you're down there, click that like and subscribe button. Click the bell icon so we get notified every time we upload new content here on Survival Dispatch. Now, I want to give a brief introduction to our panelists and then let them do most of the talking because they are the subject matter experts here today. Of course, we have the man behind Survival Dispatch. We have the CEO, Chris Heaven. Welcome back to Survival Dispatch News. It's always Thanks, a pleasure Chris. to have you. No, it's great. Always good to have you. And we have a new face here today, but someone who is keenly adept at training dogs. We have Jaden Devlin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. It is great to have you on the show today. So let's talk about canine preparedness. This is something that I don't think gets enough attention because, of course, we're always talking about, you know, beans, bullets, and band-aids, that sort of thing, that general overlay for preparedness, but getting your dogs ready for a disaster is something completely different because they have a different set of needs. Um, Jaden, you're obviously our new face here. So when we're talking about getting your dogs ready for a disaster, what are some of the things that you want to have on hand, ready to go uh, in case the worst should happen? You know, one of the things, first off, I <laughs> popped in my head is be able to feed your damn dog. <laughs> Amen. Amen, brother. You know, and, uh, you know, there's different levels to how you're going to go around and, and making sure your dog is fed. I mean, that's going to be my number one priority, just like it's going to be for most people with themselves. You know, you better mm -hmm. you better have sustenance uh, in that time. So number one thing I would think about is that. And, you know, this is just typical dog training. His toy. I will, no matter what the situation is, my dog, I mean, when shit hits the fan and I want him, he needs to be happy at the same time, not stressed. So, you know, a lot of dogs get stressed. The number one thing that helps a lot of dogs are their toys, man. And so uh, my dog would definitely, food be the number one thing that I'm thinking of. Toy, and, and that toy is also a reward. You know, when he does good things, it's a reward factor for dog training. So uh, two things that just pop up right in my head. No, that's a really good point. And I hadn't even thought about the, the toy aspect of it because – I know for a lot of working dogs, that is the big reward you see, you yeah. know, to get that play time, that interaction is really important. Uh, Chris, you had your puppers here just a second ago for the intro. Of course, we had to let her go. She was getting way too excited, uh, but uh, she was wearing her little vest. It looked amazing. Uh, what are some things that you're going to want to have on hand for a disaster for your dogs? Well, I think, you know, just like the rest of us, having some accommodations in our first aid kit for dogs. And, and some of it's simple stuff, right? Like Don's dish soap is mm -hmm. wonderful for getting parasites and ticks and whatnot off your dogs. I mean, you still need tweezers for ticks, of course. But if you, you cover up a dog that's, uh, you know, got fleas in Don dish soap, they all abandon ship. You know, they're gone. So little things like that. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, but not necessarily for debriding a wound. But because if you give a dog hydrogen peroxide, they'll puke just like that. So if they've ingested something that they shouldn't have, um, that pit bull there, first pit bull I ever had, uh, late 80s in Texas, he ate an entire roll of three and a half inch drywall sandpaper. Oh, and boy. for two days, he couldn't hold anything down. And we were fixing to take him into the vet and he passed it. And I never seen a dog so happy in my life. But, you know, by the time he passed it, it was still a good, you know, three, four inches around. So... Uh, power breeds in particular will eat things they're not supposed to at times, even when they're well-trained. Uh, so that, that would be the big thing for me is make sure in addition to the food and water, which are basic requirements to make sure that if something happens, then we can look after them. One thing I would say here in Florida, just because, you know, we take our dogs with us a lot of places is that the asphalt gets super hot. So oh. have, having a way to cover up their paws. So maybe up North when it's colder, you might want to have a jacket or something, but down here, it's not a bad idea. 
uh, for your dog kit uh, to have something to cover their paws up as well. We actually have one dog who burned his pads so bad that they ended up peeling. And it was, it was several weeks before he could kind of go out and do his business uh, because of the damage to his paws. So those, those would be the basics on my part. No, that's I'd back that up too. I'd say, yeah, it just pops in my head, man. My, my dog just running on the asphalt, you know, tears their, tears their pads up too much. So you can only imagine having to hike, you know, long journeys, whether you're in the woods, whether you're on pavement. I mean, yeah, they're, they're taking a beating. So that's an amazing point, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Even here up in the North, when it gets cold, you know, having that protection so they don't get, you know, frostbite in their paws too is another issue. Obviously all y'all Floridians, Floridians, excuse me, don't have to worry about that stuff, but here up in Indiana, we do because we do get snow every once in a while I've heard. Uh, and so that's definitely something to do. Uh, one thing I had kind of thought of was making sure that you have extra water on hand. The amount of water that your dog is going to go through, regardless of the size, is going to be probably higher in a disaster situation, especially if it's hot uh, and you don't have air conditioning like you had before. If the power goes out or something like that, having extra water on hand or an ability to make uh, clean water is a great thing to have because the last thing you want them to do is run down to the retention pond get giardia, whipworm, something like that, and then you've got a whole nother issue on your hands that you don't want to have to deal with. Rather stinky issue, I might add. <laughs> uh, one thing I was thinking was, uh, you know, having those flea and tick meds available if you, your dog uses them, if they, and this is something you want to do now with the, the uh, you know, the guidance of a vet, because I do know that some dogs don't respond well to certain types of medications. It, I would just add to that, uh, you know, because of our climate, uh, we have mosquitoes almost year round for the most part. And uh, I'm not familiar with any environment that has as many cases of heartwarming dogs as we have here in the Southeast. It, it's a real thing. So in addition to flea and tick, uh, heartworm meds and dewormer in mm -hmm. case they do get, get, you know, into some water that's contaminated. And then, you know, on the human side of things and our FAKs, when we have to bug out, we have a complete antibiotic slash OTC kit, you know, that has everything from, you know, that Iver stuff, you know, that uh, is great for killing viruses, <laughs> which I shall not say the word because last time I did our video got shut down. <laughs> so. uh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. To, to back up that point to a really good thing, obviously to keep on hand in the survival and just even now, I mean, my, I keep it in my house, colloidal silver. Uh, I'm big on silver. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. I drink a lot of colloidal silver, uh, something for your dog. They can take it. It's going to do the same thing, you know, antibacterial, antifungal. It's going to do a lot of stuff. Obviously, there's different parts per million levels of, of silver that's out there and available. Stronger, the better. Uh, but that's something I would, I would more, more I'm thinking about, I would want to keep that on hand too, and that for sure. So, anecdotal, but recent, uh, you know, so Dr. Jason Dean, our good friend over at Brave TV, frequently says that. Uh, doctors prescribe, MDs prescribe meds uh, based on a hunch as opposed to something empirical. So in other words, you have an inner ear infection. Well, how do you know that for sure? Well, it, that's what it looks like. Well, have you done a culture? If you haven't done a culture, how do you know that it's bacterial, that it's not viral or something else to that effect? So I rarely get sick. Like, I mean, rarely get sick. I've had one fever in 25 years sort of thing. And I got an uh, earache a couple months back. And so a good relationship with my primary. I texted her, told her what was going on. She called in a script, took the script for an entire week. I was down to the last pill. I texted her back. I said, I still just as bad. And so she uh, called in another script, but my wife said, just roll over here for a second. She put the colloidal silver in my ear. I woke up the next morning, infection gone. Let's dig into a little bit more of the type of dogs because I know uh, Chris and Jaden, uh, not Chris, myself, Chris uh, and Jaden, we both have German Shepherds. Other Chris, uh, Chris Evan has pit bulls. Uh, let's just talk about the different types of dogs uh, that we can have and what their uses could be in a disaster situation because I, I think this is important. Now, you're going to have people chiming in, in the comments. And like I said, let us know down in the comments what type of dog you have and what your plan is for them for SHTF. But uh, obviously the larger working breeds are, you know, kind of more preferable, but if someone has a little lap dog or something like that, what purpose do you think that that could serve in a disaster? Uh, Jaden, you've had a lot of dog experience. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and what your thoughts are? Man, I'm going to probably get a lot of hate from the, the dog community on this, but, uh, I like dogs. I don't like squirrels. So <laughs> if, uh, 
if the dog's under, you know, 50 pounds, you got a pet squirrel to me. Uh, <laughs> and I know they're very smart. There's a lot of smart, small breeds out there, but I'm, I'm, I'm not the typical person that's going to have a small breed. So I, I couldn't even get into, uh, that arena of, of, of conversation. My dogs, I, I also, I am a pit bull owner too. I have a pit bull here at the house too. Um, he's my second one in my life. Uh, Flex, he is now 14 years old. He is, oh, wow. uh, he's an old man and he's just a, he's been a fantastic dog, uh, since the day we got him. But I mean, he's the smallest dog that I've, I think I've had. And, uh, in size, I mean, he's actually, he's heavier than my German shepherd, but German shepherd towers over him. <laughs> Fair enough. So I, yeah, I'm just, a, I'm a big dog guy. I'll always be that. And so I, I'm not even sure, man, the little yappers, they're awesome companions. I totally get it. It's just not my arena field, you know, of study or, or practice. So I really couldn't talk too much about that. Yeah. Um, I think my wife has had some small dogs before in her life and stuff like that, but I, I really haven't. I, I would be, uh, I'd be fearful. Just me personally, if I had a small dog that I had to take care of. <laughs> I, I, I'd make two two points, and Jaden kind of touched on it. Number one is companionship. Um, so pretty important aspect of having canines, regardless of their size. Uh, yeah. and, and a corollary to that is that there's a ton of studies out there that show that people who have dogs typically are in better health, You know, whether it be mental, emotional, or physical. Uh, there are all these benefits of having dogs around that are kind of intangible, hard to quantify, but there are studies that have essentially done that. So there's merit, you know, I'm a, we're a power breed family here as well. Uh, but I mean, a canine companionship is a good thing. Yeah. I think when it comes to the small dog, that that's what it is. It's companionship. I mean, your, your, your six pound chihuahua ain't going to be able to, you know, do that. Do too much to ward off other animals and uh early you know, warning people. early warning system though yep that was what i was oh absolutely yeah. those are i can't say it all my chihuahua people those are the yappers good point fantastic point that even eluded me you're right man they are alarm systems for sure i stole i stole it from crush yeah it's true <laughs> uh so that was that was gonna be kind of my uh my thought process if you have a a smaller dog don't think that you're priced out of the market or that your dog can't help you in a disaster situation. So if you have a smaller dog, I think that early warning system to let you know that somebody's there so that you have enough time to get ready is really the biggest benefit. Uh, and so I would encourage to get your dog trained to give you that signal and make sure you're rewarding that signal and not telling them, oh, you know, be quiet, you know, sort of something like that. And so that's a great segue into talking about dog training. And I think that's really what I want us to focus on here for the pretty much the remainder of the video, because I think this is so incredibly important. Uh, and uh, Jaden, I know you have a lot of experience training dogs, and we were talking about this a little bit before the show. Why don't you go ahead and, you know, kind of explain your your experience in that and then uh, let us know what your training is for your shepherds. My family, uh, a lot of military in my family, um, but I did grow up away from my family, but I visited my family a lot. And, and German Shepherd was the number one breed that, uh, you know, is close to, to my family blood, it seems. And uh, I was extremely excited to, uh, back in 2016, I wanted to find a new puppy. I wanted a uh, full bred AKC. I wanted all the papers. I wanted to be pristine. I wanted to be part of the original Von Line German Shepherds. I wanted. I just wanted an amazing dog, and so uh, I was lucky to find a high end breeder here in Florida. And I, you know, I'm definitely with adopting dogs, man. But when you are looking for something specific, I mean, it's going to cost you money, and there's going to be breeders out there. I, I we tracked one down that we felt was along the lines I've been doing it a long time and uh, had success with all of his dogs and so I picked up mine at uh my my current German Shepherd Atlas uh Greek name I'm Greek Macedonian so uh uh you know I, I've even mentioned uh, earlier that my dog is trained in Greek Macedonian <laughs> a little bit of Japanese I've done jiu-jitsu for a long time but uh Picking him up and, and getting the base for him and understanding your dog breed is the number one thing when it comes to training your dog. Um, and so I have a history with German Shepherds, obviously, like I'm mentioning, but knowing that history of that dog and knowing their psychology, I mean, books are fantastic. I'll never forget when I was 14, I actually, uh, my family had adopted 
And when I was 13 years old, this just alluded me, but I just it just brought back to my head. When I was 13 years old, my family adopted a Volusia County Sheriff's dog that was retired. But yeah, training your dog comes down to the number one thing I always say is study, man. Know your dog breed. And uh, I always, I always tell people your dog is going to be a uh, – a reflection of who you are, especially when you get them as puppies. You know, the number one thing to having a great obedient dog is getting them young. Um, you know, 16 week old puppy is, is typically where you want to get your German shepherd. Most dogs at, and, um, time man, time is everything with these things. It takes a lot of time, a lot of talent and a lot of your treasure to get in with your, your animal and to become one with it. But yeah. Uh, one of my number one things, man, if you're, t I think I talked to Chris about this yesterday, you know, timid, timid dog owners will have timid dog breeds, you know what I mean? And uh, it's all up to you what you want to have. Do you need protection? I like the fact that you brought up the, uh, the harvest protection of the smaller dogs. Like that's a huge thing. Know, know what dog you want, know what you're going to need. Uh, for me, it's just always been German Shepherds and training them is, is intrinsically based on learning their personality and molding their personality uh, in a long way. I don't know if people are familiar with theta phase. Um, theta phase, uh, it's humans have theta phase. From the moment we're born to about seven years old, we are just downloading everything around us from our household to our parents to the interaction of the people we're around. A human child has theta phase and in that theta phase i mean your your five senses eyes ears nose skin touch it's all it's all downloading to the brain to the human system uh, uh your surroundings and what you're supposed to be so the same thing i apply with dogs and i apply it strongly that they have a theta phase also they have a time when they're downloading their surroundings they're downloading their activities they're downloading how you and your household are you know typically we just got past fourth of july right and uh you always hear people complain during fourth of july that the fireworks scare their dogs oh my dogs are so scared of the fireworks and they're shaking and i can't stand it what right there you can't stand it you probably actually trained your dog to be afraid of fireworks because they see that that's your reaction and uh you know your dogs are reactory to you you know what i mean so that's one of the big things in training um i hold to that man theta phase and just just properly guiding your dog while also bringing out the natural personality that you see in them. But I'm huge on getting your dog and you to match personalities. And it happened. It, it will happen. It's all about time, though. You got to spend time with your pup. Number one thing. No, those are some really solid points. And a really important thing is to, I what I liked about that was about knowing your dog breed. I had an yeah. Alaskan Malamute before I had uh, my German Shepherd. And I can tell you there. I got to stop you. I So my wife. When we got married, we have an yeah. Alaska Malamute. Yes, oh, sir. Nice. Fallon. Yes, sir. 150 pound big fluff ball, man. <laughs> uh -huh. Yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, the most common joke that I, I get from Malamute owners is Do you, does your dog shed? Well, yeah, but only twice a year, the first half of the year and the second half of the year. Uh, so, <laughs> but, you know, right, right, right. They're completely different personalities. So understanding the differences between those two is so important is why it's important to do some research before you pick a breed for yourself. And they can do different things. A Malamute may not be great at, uh, you know, personal protection unless the person is allergic to dog slobber, but they can haul a ridiculous amount of weight. So if you need to yeah. uh, train them how to haul weight, that's something they're very keen on doing. Uh, Chris, let's touch some bases on like basic obedience training. Now, I know you have your dogs trained really well, your pit bulls. Uh, give us some examples of some of the things that you started off doing with your pit bulls to get them ready, uh, you know, for this basic training. And then we'll move on to more advanced stuff. Yeah. So my wife is much more of an expert when it comes to training dogs than I am. So she deserves by far and away the bulk of the credit. But I think the first thing that I would point out is that dog owners overuse the word no. And no should be reserved strictly for those situations where you want the dog to stop dead in its tracks. You know, let, let's say it's been provoked. Um, if you're using the word no all the time and they're only paying attention to it part of the time and you need them to stop, they're not going to stop. You know, unless you they're, they've got to be exceptionally well trained. So don't overuse the word no. Only use that when it's absolute. In other words, there's some, my wife all the time. Somebody comes to the door, the dogs are barking, 
you can tell them to heal, uh, be quiet and stuff, but don't tell them no, because that's their job in their mind is to let you know that there's somebody at the door. There's potentially a bad guy out there. And we actually use that terminology. The bad guys are bad guy. Where's the bad guy? They, they key in on that word sort of thing, but from like a basic training perspective, I've, I've read some studies and I've seen some shows that say that the average dog understands somewhere between 10 and 100 words. So you've got a broad range of intelligence levels and whatnot in there, but at the lowest level, teaching them to be quiet is especially uh, particular to say a bug out situation, survival situation when you don't want them to alert somebody else to your presence, um, telling them to, but then conversely telling them to bark on command so that somebody like our male pit bull, um, we just got back from the mountains and you can hear his bark echoing off of all the other mountains around us. We're at the top of one mountain, but, uh, it's, if you didn't, uh, know better, you would still clue into the fact this is a big, it's a big doc. He's got a really deep bark, um, stay heal and drop it those those are our big commands out of all of them sort of thing because you know pit bulls are uh, you know they were originally bred uh as shepherd dogs so uh, terriers with bulldog sort of thing so they're instinctual hunters every pit bull i've had and i've had a bunch of them are very instinctual when it comes to hunting so you know we live close to water here um, and there's a river just over here river rats and roof rats are extremely common here in central Florida. And, you know, when one of them happens to unfortunately find their way into our compound, <laughs> one or, or both of our dogs will get it every single time. We were in Seattle recently, as you know, Chris. And while we were gone, our daughter-in-law was watching the house. Yeah. And our female pit walked in with a possum that was bleeding like a stuffed pig that oh, her wow. and Billy got. And she was freaking. And we got the whole thing on video, by the way, because we have a furbo, you know, <laughs> yeah. so we can feed our dogs treats when we're not home and stuff. And uh, that dang possum, she set it down, like I said, bleeding like a stuffed pig. Or, you know, Bailey turned her head. That possum stood right up and walked to the other side of the room, hid out underneath the sofa. So our daughter in law <laughs> freaked out even more. Oh, gosh, that's crazy. But yeah, they're absolutely hunters. But in that type of situation, when they've brought something to us, you know, a raccoon or whatever they've caught, drop it is is a command. It can't be a game. Like you have to have them mm -hmm. so that they understand when you say drop it, that means drop it, you know, sort of thing. So those, those would be the biggest things from a training perspective, you know, on our part. Yeah, that's Dude, really the drop it thing is huge mm -hmm. to me, guys. That That's really big, man, because, yeah. uh, uh, when I was from the age, uh, I think I was I was twenty to twenty three. I was uh, renting a condo, and the owner was uh, the reason I got the condo is I was good friends with a canine police handler, and uh, he was I believe he was actual um, the sergeant. I think he was a patrol sergeant, um, Brian. And big thing we talked about uh, with his dog, and at the time shepherd i had that time is uh when they latch onto somebody the big thing man is getting your dog to let go drop drop is huge especially in the police world because you know dogs cause extra damage and you know limit that damage if it can at the same time it's criminal you know in those situations heightened awareness and you know your dog got to go but being able to get your dog to, to to let go to drop is huge and if you have control of that and obedience that's one of the master keys to me because what dog doesn't love to have something in its mouth that it's biting down on, it's grabbing it. This is its tool, you know, it's snout and its teeth are its number one tool. They, they experience the world. It's how they test things out. And so if you can get your dog to drop what he loves to do the most, hold something, bite something down his mouth and just drop it, massive obedient factor right there. So yeah, massive point, Chris. Very good. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's really a safety factor, too, not just, you know, for yeah. for them. It's like if there's nasty stuff out there, you don't want them eating. I'll brag on my dog for just a second. Somebody had left like a piece of bologna out on the street like one day and Athena got it and I told her to drop it. And she actually dropped it. I was like, wow, OK, I guess she does listen. Uh, but you never that's know. Trust. That's yeah. big trust, man. It is yeah. trust. And that's the number one thing. Your dog's got to be able to trust you when your pup trusts you. That's when you have the, the the keys to unlocking the best out of them, you know, really is. Absolutely. And it's just so important just to that they will 
listen to you. They, they heed your, your commands and they'll just do it. And that just comes with a lot of repetition. I think it comes yep. with a lot of work, spending time with your dog. I know we just want to go to, you know, I, I said the Petco training manual. We want to go to like one of those cheap training classes and think that you're going to have a, an AKC dog, you know, doing exactly what you want on command. Uh, it's just not going to be like that. You have to spend the time with them because they're going to be a member of your family and you want to spend time with your family. Yeah, Chris. You yeah, said it, repetition. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would add a point to that as well, that mm -hmm. uh, canines are um, extremely resilient. So yeah. our, our female is a rescue. And so the first owners used her as a bait dog uh, in fighting. She's covered up in scars. The second owners physically abused her. The third owners took her away from the second owners but they had several large power breeds. She's a female. There was another female. And on Christmas Eve, this large female attacked our smaller female. She's only 60 pounds. And it ended up in a $1,200 vet bill. And then they had to keep all the dogs on one end of the house and Bailey on the other because, you know, she was petrified. So, you know, three really bad situations for her. And she actually listens better than our our gaudy pit we have a pit from the john gaudy line of pit bulls who was very expensive uh she listens even better than he does and it, it's a testament to their resiliency to be so poorly treated by other people but yet they still just want to please they just want to do the right thing so yeah repetitions for sure no question at all but if your dog doesn't respond it, it's the repetitions will get it there because at the end of the day they want to please their master mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely 100%. just like all creatures i believe love is a big thing man your, your dogs they they know what real love is mm -hmm. and uh when you truly love your dog they love you back i mean it is it's it's mirrored like i said everything's a reflection and you know you 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 know it's so funny how many times i've, I've met a dog owner and i've seen that dog owner just lift up his hand and i've seen that dog flinch and it's like that tells you a lot and that dog is yep. never going to want to please that it's it's not going to happen man so love is huge and like you both are saying repetition it's a muscle everything's a muscle you know a dog's brain is a muscle ours is a muscle repetition is what works it gets it stronger and builds the trust so yeah huge points guys huge well you know i think it it comes down to a lot of positive reinforcement you know we're talking about that and i know we're talking before, Jaden, you said your wife's a zoologist. She works with some stuff that's a whole lot bigger than a German shepherd. And <laughs> yeah. it's amazing what some of these animal trainers can do with these larger animals. We're talking tons at this point, uh, you know, with just some positive reinforcement and repetition. And that has to be so critical. I mean, you were telling us some stories before that were just just crazy about some of the stuff that she deals with. Yeah, my wife is uh, fantastic. She is a uh, uh, zoologist, has a zoology degree, and uh, more or less, you know, knows everything about the animals that she works with, you know, when it comes down to, you know, taxonomy and the scientific stuff. But the best thing about her is the hands-on working with, she specifically works with elephants, giraffes, and lions. And uh out of all of those, the scariest one is actually the elephant, not the lion. The elephant is the scariest one to work with. They are extremely intelligent. I mean, they're smarter than most humans that I've met in my life. You know, that's just how it goes. They're just, they're insanely intelligent. My wife actually, um, I mean, daily, I mean, it, when she goes to work, I am nervous all day long for the last 10 years of her life, you know, because you never know what happened, what's going to happen. But um, she is absolutely the best on her team. Uh, she's one of the top in the entire world with elephants. And so it's just a fantastic thing to see. And uh, trust me, my wife can control a 10 ton elephant when she comes home. I I listen to her, <laughs> you know, so she's going to handle it, me too, which I'm an animal. And, and I think that's one of the reasons we connected so well is uh, she's an animal trainer and handler with, uh, with degrees and understanding. And I'm definitely an animal, which is why I believe that I get along with my dogs more than I do most people. Um, even though, you know, I am a people person, but man, you know, I, I, I'm a dog guy. I'm an animal guy. And thank God I have a, a wife that is that, and she knows how to keep me under tracks because I need it a lot of the times. Uh, but yeah, fantastic. I've taken a lot of cues from my wife. Um, you know, uh, I watch a lot of the videos. She films a lot of stuff. 
um, with the animals and uh, she comes home and one of the first things she does is show me videos of the day, you know, what she got some of the animals to do. And it's amazing when you see a person, you know, click their fingers and you watch an elephant lift, lift up and, <laughs> and stand on two legs <laughs> and put their legs down. All right, let's try this side. Boom. And they lift it and, you know, fantastic stuff. And she, same thing, man, it's reinforcement of behaviors. And so that's a huge thing with going back to the personality of your dog and, and, and the breed of the dog, right? Go back to the Malamute. My Malamute, our Malamute, Fallon, he, he was a male dog, 150 pounds, but I called him princess. Mm -hmm. He was a princess, super prissy dog. I mean, and one of the funny things, Chris has met, met Fallon before he passed away. Uh, he, he passed away at 14 and uh, if you say, are you pretty? You're pretty boy. Oh, my God. He lost his mind. Oh, I he knows the word pretty because he was prissy. So knowing that and, and even with Fallon, we were able, you know, everything about training, animal training is, is pulling out the natural behavior of that breed or that animal. And a uh, big difference, obviously, from, you know, an Alaska Malamute to a pit bull to a German shepherd to an elephant uh, number one thing there for any animal handler is you are just learning that personality and how you can accentuate it, how you can bring it out better and how, how it can, you know, really tie into what you as an owner also are requiring of it, right? When I got my German Shepherd, the number one reason I, I, I got Atlas uh, was for home protection. In 2016, I opened up a nightclub. And um, I was not going to be home a lot. I was the owner and operator. I built it from the ground up. And uh, I knew I would be working long, you know, nights, getting home at 3, 4 in the morning. And my wife, she's up at it and, and on the road by 5 a.m. to go hand over the elephants. And I actually heard <laughs> That's Atlas behind me licking his private parts. Let me, <laughs> and that right there. So uh, th that's a behavior, right? I I'm huge. <laughs> it drives me nuts when I start hearing animals lick themselves. And so real two snaps to my finger, boom, he stops. And I was, you know, I brought that out of him from knowing his behaviors and doing, you know, finding out how to, how to, how to get that to reflect back to what I want. So everything is a manipulation factor of what's already there. You know, and so massive key factors. And again, just going back and, and restating again, it's just knowing the animal, knowing the breed, knowing the personality and uh, rewarding, man, rewarding for what it is. I got a German Shepherd because I wanted home protection when I wasn't home for my wife. And there is nothing better than this guy right here. Uh, he's just fantastic. So, yeah, know what you want, know what you can do with it. And it'll all work out. And the number one thing I'll, I'll keep going back to, and I might say it again uh, later on in this interview, love. Love is huge, man. When, you're, when your animals uh, know that you care to the utmost for it. I'll give you a quick story of why I really bonded with Atlas. Um, he, he almost died at a year and a half years old. We had him for a year and a half when he found a small ball in my yard. And it was from the lot. I have a lot next to me that's undeveloped. And I don't know if kids threw it in there or something, but I see my dog playing with a small ball. And before I even, he's only a year old. He's still learning. He's still processing, downloading the world that he's in. He grabbed that ball and he had it at the tip of his snout. And uh, he did one of these moves like this and he huffed at the same time. Ball went right into his throat, just right into his throat. And me and my wife were standing outside and I saw him. He's trying to cough it out and he's not making a single, a single noise. And automatically I just, I freaked out and I go, Oh, he's choking. That's a hundred percent. He's choking. I run over to him and he just looks at, he's already a year and a half and we've had nothing but training from, from the, uh, I want to say 20 weeks old. We started at 16 weeks old, but by 20 weeks old, he's doing prey training, IPO, you know, field training, just really getting him into things. And so he already has this big trust level with me. And th this was just such a connecting moment for me and, and my German shepherd. Uh, as soon as I ran over to him, I dropped to my knees and I looked him in his eyes and he looked at me and he just stopped moving. And I grabbed, uh, you know, 
his front paws with one hand, his back paws with the other hand, and I flipped him onto his side as fast as I can. Boom. And he just looked up at me and he goes, do what you got to do. He had full trust in me. And uh, thank God I was able to get that ball out of his throat with the right techniques. But I mean, he tongue went blue, um, completely lifeless, limpless. And then I was able to get that thing out of his mouth and through out of his throat. I actually had to reach down into his throat to properly grab it. The, the rolling technique wasn't working because this ball had spines on it. It had these little tiny spines. It was a rubber ball with spines all over it. So the rolling technique wasn't working. And so I literally, I grabbed, I grabbed and pinched his throat close to like, you know, his dog clavicles. And I was able to reach my hand in down his throat. And I pulled that ball out. I worked it as much as I could. But at that moment, the connection that I got with with him after that exceeded so much. And, you know, that's just, that was the love. I mean, I got so emotional at that moment. You know, as soon as the ball got out, I remember yelling. I mean, all my neighbors heard me. I was like, ah, you know, got this, this, this immediate emotional scream out of me because I was, you know, I almost lost who had already turned in a year and a half, my best friend. This dog was just so amazing to me. And uh, that moment on, it was a connection. Now, I'm not saying I hope that everybody has those those moments where you got to prove your dog not. how much yeah, you, you care and love for your dog. But the point there is those moments of trust. And, and you know, even, you know, somebody walking down the street that uh, is untrustworthy to your dog and teaching your dog, you know, your reaction factors. He saw how he reacted with the ball in his throat. He knew that I went right for him and I was there to protect him. Ever since then, he's been more protective of me than, than he was before. I mean, just a, a huge factor. And and that is love, man. That is just the, the love and the immediate reaction that I had for this dog. And I mean, I don't know what. I've never been more connected to any of my dogs than I have Atlas. So uh, it's just a huge thing for me. And uh, <laughs> like I can, I can get emotional. I can cry over. That's how attached I am to this, this damn dog. He's just amazing, man. He is absolutely amazing. I know, I know I'm rambling now because at the moment I just start thinking about the love that I have for, for these animals and in the way that my wife is with the animals and here at our home, it's just, it's everything to me. So if, if that shit hits the fan moment does happen, I know for a fact, my German shepherd is my best friend in that moment. And he knows he has one in me. So that's, that'll always be one of my biggest things of training, man. That is huge. Get that connection with your dog and become one with them and uh, trust, trust and love, man. Trust and love. I'll stop rambling. Go ahead, guys. <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, obviously, thank you for sharing that story. That's uh, has to be a defining moment in your time with your dog. Let's let's kind of dig down into the more intensive training because I think this is where the real money hits the road, or where the rubber hits the road rather, uh, and sometimes the money too because it's not cheap. Uh, obviously, getting more advanced training. But what are some tips you can say, uh, Chris? You know, with training that you've done with your dogs, uh, what are some things that people can start doing to kind of getting their dog ready for SHTF without having to spend like thousands of dollars on personal protection training? Now that's obviously invaluable, but what are some things people could start doing right now? Well, I think the biggest factor there is the breed that they choose. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, when you start pure breeding dogs, you end up with uh, some very strong traits related to each individual breed. So, you know, Staffordshire Terriers, American Staffordshire Terriers, Pitbull Terriers, uh, you know, the unscrupulous people out there who fought these dogs, they, they didn't breed them because of their physicality, their musculature. There's no physiological difference, no such thing as a lockjaw and a canine or anything like that. But what the common factor is, is that, you know, like a, a 40, 50 pound Pitbull who's been shredded by 175 you know, pound Akita will end up killing the Akita for one reason and one reason only. It won't stop because of its love for its master and its family unit. So you're gonna, from a training perspective, you're going to get a huge variance based on the breed of dog and what your intended purpose is. So, so for me, having you know power breeds, part of the equation has always been the, the self-defense component, the protection component, you know, protect my wife, protect our property, protect myself, all those sort of things. So I think you can train just about any dog to, you know, do a bunch of stuff. But as far as having it really hardwired into them, that's that's pretty breed specific. And there's a reason that shepherds and and pit bulls and, and cane corsos and whatnot are referred to as power breeds. Um, they are predisposed to being the alpha. 
So from a training perspective, the next big thing beyond the breed that you choose is recognizing the fact that as a pack animal, if you don't lead as the alpha, they will. So a lot of people who lose control their dogs ha have done so because what Jaden's saying, the, the dogs pick up on all of the energy around them. So if, if somebody's a nervous Nelly, that dog will be a, a nervous dog. If somebody is, you know, unhinged, the dog will end up unhinged. Um, so it's, it's important, especially with power breeds that you take control and make sure that that dog knows where they fit into the grand scheme of things, that there's a hierarchy. And when they challenge you, you have to put them back in their place, but without abusing them, you know, so by far and away, that's for me, from a power breed perspective, the most important thing is recognizing if there's a vacuum of leadership, they will take it. And now you've got a problem. Now, now you've got a, you know, a dog who's strong and has the ability to hurt other dogs and people, and you don't have any control over that dog. So I guess it's kind of a broad thing that I'm mentioning, but that's to me the most important things. Choose the breed specific to what your goals are and recognize the fact that if you do have a power breed, you need to be in control. You brought up an amazing thing, Chris, which is alpha. And uh, which should be a, a big, massive, you know, main topic here, main, main point of topic. Um, and what's funny is a couple of years ago, there was a show on, I think it was TBS or TNT or something where uh, um, I, I know the guy's name is like Adam Conover or something. Uh, funny, Joe Rogan, a few other people talked about this episode. I'll never forget watching this episode of this show on TBS. It's like Ask Adam Anything or something where they, they try to prove, you know, certain ideological points wrong what's the truth here and he had this whole episode that that alpha is not real in dog packs and in, in an animal world there's no such thing as an alpha and there was a huge uproar back when it when it happened and uh i'll never forget watch it didn't hear the joe rogan podcast a week or two later when when he's tearing this guy apart but i remember watching with my wife and i dead stopped and i went did he just say that there was a study on wolves that there's no such thing as an alpha in a wolf pack i go are you crazy i looked over at my wife zoologist and i said you know animals pretty well. What is the alpha? And she goes, oh, it's demonstrated in almost every level of animals. There is an alpha. There's always a leader. And so uh, if any of you guys out there listening to this, this uh, podcast, this interview, uh, know what I'm talking about. It was an absolute joke of an episode that was aired nationally, and you can probably find it on YouTube. But being the alpha to your dog is the key. That is the number one key to me. Um, everything I said before, Chris just brought the the truth out of all of it. it. It all falls down to that, being the alpha for your pup. And uh, they're looking for leadership. And if you're not the leader, well, guess what? They're going to lead over you, and they're going to be uncontrollable. You know what I mean? And that's a huge thing. And that's just like a teenager, right? A parent that doesn't doesn't step up and show that they are the alpha of the household. They run the household. We pay the bills here. You get food from us. You do all this from us. You know, and that kid starts becoming that wild teenager. It's like, well, you've lost control, right? And so same thing. Your dog is your kid. You got to you gotta alpha. You got to let it know this is what we do. I, I'm providing food, shelter, love, trust, everything that you need. And you got to be an alpha to do that. If not, Chris just nailed it right on the head, man. And that's something I should have brought up earlier. And, and, and I knew Chris would be the person that would, that would uh, connect what I just failed to with that. That's it, man. Alpha being the alpha to your pup is number one. If you are the, I mean, especially with these be the breeds, right? The power breeds that you're talking about. If you're not, they are all, every single dog is based off of wolf genetics. And it is undeniable that there is an alpha leader in wolf packs. And so those genetics are passed along to every breed of dog it's not just the power ones it's every breed of dog but you know obviously over genetic mutation history you know certain aspects are copied right everything in genetics is a photocopy certain dogs are going to lose how strong that alphaness is in their breed but they all have it ultimately some just more than others so yeah number one thing be the alpha to your dog and that's where you get the respect so uh, there are all kinds of studies out there like scientific studies that show that domesticated dogs and wolves are more genetically similar than different races of human beings it's it's yep. wow. they it's, say, uh, 
I've read that most studies I have read on the genetic level of dogs, most dogs are still 95%. Well, even a tiny little, you know, Jack Russell Terrier is supposed to have 90 plus percent genetic um, relatability to its ancestral wolf. I mean, that's, that's wild. You know what I mean? So, it, you know, the study, study wolf packs, yeah. <laughs> especially when shit hits the fan, man, you know, when you're in an urban situation, and like I said, here in Florida, we have urban with, with the wild right next to us, wherever you go in Florida, we are just split down the middle. And uh, in those situations, knowing how to be an alpha in both scenarios, walking down a street or being in the woods, you better be that alpha because that is what your dog is looking for. It's de it's demanded on its genetic level to have a leader. So yeah, massive point. And yeah, every dog, every dog is a little wolf. I don't care what it is, that little chihuahua, that yapper we were talking about. Ultimately, <laughs> that is a, that's got some timber wolf in there. It's got something in there just ready to be feisty, you know, and uh, yeah, massive points, guys. Massive. I'd, I'd love to see the the wolf that a chihuahua came from, you know, but uh, <laughs> you know, to, to just kind of, to just kind of bring it back, you know, talking about being the alpha, I think the, the biggest thing that, that I took away was something that uh, my first dog's breeder talked to me about being the alpha is it's not a point of, of course it's coming from a point of strength, but when you're the alpha to your dog, it's more of a calming, relaxing feeling. It's mm -hmm. the best way I can describe it is that they can be confident in your confidence. Mm -hmm. And just being in control is a very relaxing, uh, calm feeling. It's not some domineering, oh, you have to do what I say type of thing. It's more of like what we were talking about, a loving relationship, a trusting relationship that they understand that you are going to be there. You're not going to lead them in the wrong direction or get them hurt or something like that, that they know that they can trust you uh, completely. It's a very calming, relaxing thing. So just that feeling of being in charge should not be something that is difficult for you when you're the alpha. And this is not, we're not talking about like alpha, beta male stuff like that. That's, that's a whole nother conversation. That's a whole bunch of BS, but being the alpha for your dog should be something that you should cherish and respect because it's a very important position for them in their life yeah. it's leadership role you know just yep. be the leader for for your animal same thing for your household you know be a man be a leader for for your household that's ultimately what you're called for my wife uh everybody my dog my friends close they all trust me because number one thing I, I give them the trust and love first and it's reciprocated you know certain people certain animals whatever might might want to test that every once in a while and uh, it's natural to want to test that. Uh, I think for a human being or a dog, you want to test who is the alpha around you, who's the leader around you. And uh, it, it will, it's mostly shown in, in unadulterated, pure love and trust. That's it, man. Yeah, absolutely, guys. I don't think I could have said it better myself. Uh, I think that's a great point to go ahead and call it a video. Uh, obviously, I want to thank both you guys so much for being here and giving us your understanding of canines and being prepared for anything to happen. I think, honestly, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaways, in my opinion, get your dog trained, have them, you know, obedience, love your dog, make sure you've got things on hand for them in case the balloon goes up and just be that leader. And you will have someone next to you who oh. is going to go to bat for you uh, when things go south. And I'm not talking about south in Florida. <laughs> yeah well the florida is the only place in the country where you got to go north to get to the south oh there's the big boy right there yeah. there's atlas <laughs> this is atlas this is my boobies. this is my man yeah cool. say hello want to make sure you got a little camera time in for who he is no it's so great thanks guy. for thanks for getting him on that's <laughs> awesome that's and he is one. i mean he's been sitting here laying the whole time quiet, i saw him just i, I mean, saw him walking he's such an background. amazing guy <laughs> oh it's awesome <laughs> all right well thank you so much <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Again, if you haven't done so, make sure you get down, click that like and subscribe button, click the bell icon, and leave us a comment. Let us know what your dog is, what you're planning on doing for SHGF, and what you learned from this video. We really appreciate all of our viewers, and we'll catch you on the next one.